tree and we are live now so welcome everyone to another dental shadowers virtual shadowing session today we're joined by dr estrin who is a periodontist thank you for joining us dr estrin and whenever you're ready you can go ahead and take it away okay yeah um thank you for having me my name's uh, nathan estrin and uh I'm, uh, I just graduated from Perio Residency a couple months ago, so I'm not too far removed from the application cycle. Um, hopefully with the shadowing session, you can see just a little bit of some of the cases that I do and get exposed to a basic overview of periodontics to see if it's a good fit for you. Um, feel free to ask questions at, at any point uh, and, and stop me and I can always elaborate on something. So originally I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I've, I've traveled quite a bit in my educational pursuits. So I went to undergrad at Indiana University where I majored in kinesiology. I was on track to be a, a physical therapist. Uh, and then I changed it to dentistry kind of during my junior year of undergrad. Um, I went to Lecom Dental School here in Florida and Bradenton. And then went on to perio residency at Stony Brook University. And uh, I just graduated July 1st and returned back to Florida because I loved it so much. Um, and something ab about me is that I wasn't really the strongest applicant applying to dental school. I think I had a 3-4 GPA and, and uh, average DAT score. So you know, I, I, I really just uh, was aggressive in, in the in amount of schools that I applied to and, and uh, reached out and, and began networking after the application cycle. Uh, so I don't want anyone to feel intimidated like they can't make it or, or you know, their, their, their GPA or DAT scores aren't good enough. Um, but I'll touch on that more in a second. So this is the office that I'm working at today. It's a, it's a really nice, well put together office. Uh, we've got about 20 operatories and four general dentists and I'm the periodontist in the office doing all the perio work. And then this guy right here, Dr. Richard Myron is my mentor. So he's a periodontist PhD and uh, he was trained in, in Bern, Switzerland. And now he's focusing just on research and developing new technologies. He's, he's really an incredible person to learn from and I'm coming in and doing the clinical work, but I still have this uh, very well-known and respected periodontist in the field to kind of guide me. So it's a really great situation. I'm here two days a week, and then the other days of the week, I'm traveling in different offices, uh, some corporate, some private practice, uh, just to get as much experience as I can since I'm fresh out. Uh, so I was starting to touch on some advice for pre-dental students. And, and the biggest advice I can give you guys is to just persevere. If you, if you really want to be a dentist and you know it's for, for you and you keep applying, you'll, you'll eventually get it as long as you're continuously improving and, and improving on your application. Uh, and the biggest advice I can be is don't just be a number, right? I was just a number and an average number at that but I reached out and called schools and went to their open house and tried to connect with as many people as I could at each school, just so that I wasn't a number anymore. I was a face and you become a lot harder to reject after that. You know, like Nate's such a good guy, you know, he really wants to be a dentist. Um, you know, you obviously you don't want to push it, but there's a way to do it in a very professional and, and respectable way. And that's what you should really own in on is don't just, submit your application and cross your fingers, but try to establish some type of constant communication. Uh, and then when you do get accepted at dentistry, don't, don't take it for granted. You know, think about uh, and remember how bad you wanted to get into dental school and, and, and keep that momentum going forward. Because there, there's always something new. There's always a new exam, a new uh, something to learn, a new uh, competency or residency to get into or job to apply for. So, you know, take it in stride, keep your mental health in check and just keep, keep going forward uh, and, and appreciate how far you've come along the way. Um, and then once you get into, into dental school, everyone around you is eventually going to be your colleagues and everything that you're learning is directly related to your field. So I have 
great relationships with uh, a lot of my my friends from dental school, and and we've actually been overlapping uh, from a professional standpoint as I'm now the periodontist in some of their offices, uh, and and no knowledge is wasted. And I think that the biggest thing that I did was I continued shadowing. So I I actually just graduated from perio residency and I shadowed an oral surgeon two weeks after I graduated, just because uh, you're always picking up tips from other people. You know, dentistry is kind of arts and crafts in a way. There's a lot of uh, dental clinical pearls that you can pick up on uh, and you can always learn from people. So I think you appreciate shadowing more once you're deeper into the field because you can directly relate it to your own cases. Uh, even if you pick up a line from someone, it's just always beneficial to continue shadowing. So I, I'm still shadowing, even though I'm, I'm out of school and residency, and I probably will continue to shadow. Uh, and then about the interviews, I see a lot of colleagues work so hard for their GPA and their DAT scores that when they get to the interview, they just wing it or not prepare. But I really believe that interviewing is a skill and something that you can get better at. Uh, you know, you can probably predict most of the questions you'll be asked at any interview for any job. You know, they're very basic. Tell me about yourself, you know, greatest strengths and, and weaknesses. I mean, you can just Google sample interview questions and practice saying them, you know, to a friend or in the mirror. I think that's what helped me the most at these interviews because I had rehearsed them so much. Um, don't be robotic and that you have lines prepared, but just be comfortable answering those questions because you've answered them so many times in several different ways that it's going to come out naturally. So I, I actually took a uh, interview course when I was at Indiana University, uh, just solely to prepare for interviews at dental school. Uh, and this was the biggest thing that I took away from the course. It was called the STAR method. So every time they ask you a question, this is kind of a, a, a methodology in answering that question. And you don't really need to dig into details or think, okay, now I explain the task or, or get all technical. But the biggest thing to take away from it is that last part return, right? So situation, task, action, result, and then return. And that's naturally how you, how you communicate when you're not put under pressure, like, um, for example, your greatest weakness, you know, for my, my example for that one was a uh, situation. I was over committing to things saying yes to, you know, a uh, friend's birthday and also saying yes to a research meeting and they were over overlapping task. I created a planner. Um, I needed to find a way to keep myself organized and keep myself from over committing action every single time that you know, I, I wanted to commit to something. I pulled out that planner to make sure nothing else was going on. And result, when it ended up happening, I became very organized and a very schedule-oriented person. So the question was my biggest weakness, and I've slowly turned that into a strength. And then this biggest thing, return. return. And that's why I think I'll be a great periodontal resident, because I'm very schedule-oriented, and I can handle a heavy workload uh, and a complicated schedule. So that return, you know, being on the other side of interviews, when people return it back to that question or return it back to why you're here for that interview, you just come off as uh, light years ahead of everyone else. So I, you know, if anyone wants some of my coursework or some of my papers from that course, just reach out to me at the end of this meeting and I'll be happy to share it. Hope, uh, hope this helps a little bit. So this is just the overall uh, definition of periodontics. It's a specialty uh, of dentistry encompassing uh, the diagnosis and treatment of diseases of supporting and surrounding tissues. So periodontal disease specifically or regenerating the periodontium. Um, but it is a surgical specialty. It's not as inv invasive as oral surgery. Uh, people call it oral surgery light. Uh, so I, I think of it as periodontics as the surgical specialty more related to dentistry, while oral surgery is, is more involved in medicine. You know, and, and granted, there's outliers for both of those comparisons, but that's a good way to put it uh, for, for someone that's thinking about 
going into one of those specialties. Uh, and you're primarily focused on treating periodontitis, uh, maintaining periodontitis, and, and focusing on the surrounding structures of teeth. And it also encompasses implant dentistry and rebuilding alveolar bone and supporting structures for implant placement. Uh, I, periodontics is one of those specialties that's just a collection of niches. So no periodontist is the same. Uh, everyone has their own uh, a special niche within perio, right? So some of my tendings are excellent at soft tissue grafts and they do a lot of gum grafts for people with recession while others are, are really, uh, their niche is, is assessing sinus or assessing failing implants. So it's just a, a collection of niches and also it's a very research-based specialty. So I like perio because, you know, it's, you're very involved in research, keeping up to date with current literature and what's out there. And the specialty is always adapting because of it. I think that's very important. So a typical day as a periodontist, you've got, uh, you know, right now I've got a, long, a, a lot of appointments that are long surgeries and then sandwiched between a lot of post-op visits. So after, after I do a surgery, I'm evaluating them at two weeks and four weeks post-operatively. Uh, and those are usually quick visits where you do a suture removal, a lot of consults, um, and most importantly, collaborating with general dentists, right? Because I can place implants and I can do a lot of these procedures, but my work only comes so far. You need a good general dentist who's going to quarterback the team, uh, so to speak. Uh, there's no set way to practice. You know, you can have your own practice. You can work at a, at, you know, at, at a an office with a lot of general dentists and you supply the perio, um, or you can, you know, travel to different offices. I'm I'm kind of doing a combination right now to see what I like but there's really no right or wrong way. Uh, one thing about specialists in general is that you're marketing yourself to other general dentists, while general dentists are marketing themselves to uh, the overall population and, and patients. So general dentists should have a better sense of if your dentistry, it, you know, how good your dentistry are is how good your skills are. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and each way to practice has different uh, pros and cons. So not having my own office and, and traveling to different offices allows me to have a flexible schedule, right? Because I can take a week off and, and go on vacation and I have no staff that I'm hiring and no overhead because I'm just using that office. I just need to let the office know ahead of time before patients are scheduled that I won't be coming in. So that's why I like it for now. Um, but there's, there's definitely some limitations to that. So what kinds of co complaints do patients present with? I think there's, there's two major categories, patients that want to save their teeth uh, or patients that are trying to replace missing teeth. So if they want to save their teeth, you know, that's, that's what periodontists do best. Uh, treating teeth with periodontitis with either a flap procedure. Uh, I'll get into the procedures here in a second, yeah. So the first line of defense is non-surgical therapy, a deep cleaning. Uh, and then all the surgical treatment can be divided into either resective where you're removing surrounding tissues and bone like crown lengthening or osseous surgery or a flap procedure. Uh, and then also regenerative where you're trying to regenerate the periodontal apparatus that was lost, or you're trying to regenerate the patient's alveolar ridge or rebuild structures um, like sinus lifts, for example, where you're building bone in their maxillary sinus for implant placement or soft tissue grafting when patients have recession. So important terms in periodontics, uh, Periodontium, so tissues that invest and support the teeth, including the gingiva, alveolar mucosa, cementum, periodontal ligament, and alveolar and supporting bone. And periodontitis is inflammation of that periodontal apparatus, which results in clinical attachment loss. So I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse. I can't really see my mouse, but if you look at this image to the right, you can see the gingiva, and it's all inflamed inflamed uh, gum tissue. And right here against the tooth, you see plaque and calculus build up in that pocket. 
And as that plaque and calculus builds up, you have your own body uh, generates this inflammatory response where it begins as gingivitis, itis, inflammation of the gingiva, and your connective tissue and is recruiting more blood vessels uh, so that they can get more white blood cells to the area to combat this, this plaque and calculus and this bacterial insult in your pocket. And as a result, your alveolar bone breaks down underneath, right? To create more room for the, this, you know, inflamed uh, connective tissue. And that's essentially, you know, the whole pathogenesis of periodontitis. So what I tell my patients, patients ask me all the time, you know, what's the difference between a five millimeter pocket, a six millimeter pocket, or what's the big deal with a pocket? And I tell them the deeper the pocket, the more anaerobic bacteria that they have. Um, and that's why we need to do pocket elimination procedures. Uh, so th this might be a little bit, old, you know, if, if none of you are, are in dental school yet, this might be a little bit um, uh, too, too in detail, but, you know, that's part of shadowing is that you go in there and you see what it is without completely understanding it and just taking as much as you can away from it. So why is periodontitis so important? Uh, periodontitis is, is usually a chronic disease, so it, it manifests slowly over a lifetime and presents in older populations. And we can see that about 47% of the population has periodontitis, 64 million of adults 30 years or older. So a lot of people, almost half the population have periodontal disease that needs to be assessed. Uh, and that's something that's often missed by general dentists. So periodontitis is a major dental negligence uh, lawsuit. Uh, and this is actually a company, if you just search dental negligence, uh, this is a company, I believe, based in the UK, just when I Googled dental negligence. And you see that this is a whole company organized at targeting patients that have been diagnosed with periodontitis and helping them sue their dentist. So this is, this is very scary and very alarming for all dentists. So regardless if you're going into uh, periodontics as a specialty or not, it's really important that you understand how to, uh, how to diagnose and, and manage periodontal disease. So this is the main diagnostic tests and instruments that we use. Uh, this is the periodontal probe. So you can see these little tick marks. Each tick mark is one millimeter. So we stick that into the pocket and just measure how deep it is. Um, and then we, you know, we, we do this whole chart. So we do six sites per tooth, which you can see here. We've got three on the front, on the buccal side of the teeth, and three on the back. Uh, and then if you look at this middle image, this is how we evaluate as you walk your probe. So you slowly, slowly move it around 360 degrees around the tooth, trying to find where the bone levels uh, stop at. And you can see in the last picture, right? If you don't angle your probe underneath the contact in between, uh, interproximally between teeth, then you might be missing uh, a pocket that was there. So like I said, non-surgical therapy, if a patient has periodontal disease and they have these inflamed pockets, uh, the first line of defense is to uh, is a non-surgical approach, and the objective is to alter or eliminate microbial etiology and factors that contribute to periodontal disease. So scaling and root planing with curettes, you're essentially anesthetizing the patient so that they're comfortable and going to the depth of the pocket and removing all that plaque and calculus and also uh, some of that disease cementum, some of that disease root surface. That's why it works so well, right? Because you remove this superficial layer of cementum and you've got this, this fresh layer that's uh, conducive to repair. And then new technology in periodontics, uh, you guys may or may not have heard of it, but platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, and it's, it's being used regularly in dental offices now, specifically surgical offices. So it's a centrifuge. We essentially draw the patient's blood, put them in a centrifuge, spin it at a high uh, centrifugal force. And what we see over here on the right is this test tube that separates 
red blood cells from platelets and leukocytes. So we can isolate platelets uh, and leukocytes, leukocytes being white blood cells to help uh, fight off bacteria, and platelets, which uh, from, uh, generate growth factors like PDGF or VEGF that help with healing. So I, start I started using this at my Lakewood Ranch dental office, and I'm seeing much better healing at the two-week and four-week post-ops than I would otherwise, because these growth factors are being released. It's the patient's own growth factors, and they're healing much better because of it. Um, and while this isn't necessarily new, because it's here and present, I do see that the technology is improving. They're being able to separate these cells much easier. Um, and then they're taking this platelet fibrin clot outside the body, heating it, heating it up, doing thermal, um, thermal processing on it. And they're able to make this membrane last much longer. So while this platelet rich fibrin membrane that I pull out will resorb in a, in a few weeks, now when we heat it up in a device, it can last four to six months, which is significant and better than the man-made membranes um, that we're using in our dental offices now. So I just wanna go over a few cases. So this is a first case. Uh, this is a 48 year old female. She comes in with a chief complaint. I don't want to lose any teeth. She's got not, no significant medical history, originally from Pakistan. And the patient is now a stay at home wife. So you can see from her smile line, she does have a low smile line. Uh, at initial appearance, it looks like she's got nice teeth. Uh, and when we do our intraoral examination, you can see a large calculus bridge on her lower anterior teeth. Uh, she's missing several teeth. She's got several restorations and a few cavities. But the main problem is that she's got a lot of plaque and calculus. Um, and pretty much her story was that she became an empty nester and her kids went to college and she became very depressed and didn't brush her teeth for three years. So now we're seeing this inflammatory reaction as a response. So gingival examination and perio, you're, you're looking at the, at the gums a lot. So papillary edema, you can see that her, her papilla are very inflamed. Papilla is a little piece of tissue in between teeth. She's got a lot of plaque and calculus buildup. Uh, a lot of bleeding. These are just a general, uh, generalized gingival index and plaque index. This is just a scale that we use in perio to measure how inflamed and, and, and the bleeding scores of some of our patients to give some value to them. She's also got a lack of attached tissue in her lower anterior teeth. You can see her gingivas receded quite a bit in that area. But overall, you know, you don't have to even go be in dental school to look at this and say that her gums are angry. So this is the perio chart, um, just the initial perio chart. And you can see, you know, we don't really need to get too in detail with it, but I just want to show you an example of what one looks like uh, and the numbers that we record when we walk that probe around her gums. Um, we did have to anesthetize her to do this. And because of the calculus, we didn't, um, you know, we couldn't get all the readings, but this was uh, at least some numbers to base it off of. And we, when we look at her x-rays, you can see she's got quite a bit of bone loss, right? The, the bone should be right under the crowns of her teeth, but um, in her lower anterior, where we saw that big calculus build up, she's got maybe 70% bone loss, more than 50 everywhere else. Quite a lot of her teeth are, are mobile. And this is a, a panoramic radiograph, which we use for a big picture overview. And here you can appreciate the bone loss even more, definitely more than 50% in most sites. And here we look at an overview of the pocket depths. So uh, pockets that are between zero and three millimeters are considered healthy, between three and five moderate, and over five severe. So she's got mostly moderate and severe pocketing around all her teeth. And when we look at the etiology, it's a uh, dysbiosis of biofilm in a susceptible host. So biofilm, you know, everybody's got that bacteria in their mouth, but it's normally a healthy aerobic type of bacteria. 
dysbiosis of the biofilm is that conversion from aerobic bacteria to anaerobic, more, more uh, gram negative type of bacteria in a susceptible host. So we add susceptible hosts because periodontitis is a genetic disease and not everybody gets periodontitis when they uh, neglect their home care. So we know that this patient has a genetic predisposition to periodontitis and you know, they, they, they lack home care. They've got this dysbiosis of the biofilm and that's why her periodontitis occurred. So risk indicators being her poor oral hygiene and lack of periodontal maintenance therapy, right? She never came in for cleanings, never brushed her teeth at home. She, when you let yourself go for three years and you're susceptible to periodontitis, this is the result. Uh, there's a lot of different prog prognostic uh, um, factors that we use. Uh, this, this one is one that I like specifically. So when we assess prognosis for teeth, we're looking at if I do periodontal treatment, how likely am I to reach periodontal stability, being that the teeth, you know, return back to a healthy state and, and will stabilize. Uh, if the teeth is considered hopeless, right, we, we extract them. Uh, overall, I had this patient as unfavorable because I can come in, I can do deep cleanings, I can do flap surgery, but I can't control her home care. So with a lack of home care, uh, it's, we, we, we wouldn't achieve periodontal stability. Uh, so overall unfavorable with, she had one tooth that was hopeless because it was just kind of floating in gum tissue. Um, and that's, that's the challenge with, with treating periodontal disease is that you're taking patients that have been neglecting their home care. And now all of a sudden you can do treatment on them, but they have to change their habits. And that's the hardest part. A lot of them want to. Uh, change their ways, but uh, it's hard to change their habits, right? Everybody knows they should go to the gym more and eat better and brush their teeth better and floss. It's hard to actually make it a habit and, and make it a part of your lifestyle. So that's, that's one of the biggest challenges with, uh, with perio as a specialty. So just to give you an overview of what a treatment plan looks like, a perio treatment plan, I should specify, Phase one, we have our initial therapy. Uh, we couldn't really get an adequate uh, probing depth because there was so much calculus and debris in the way. So we plan just the full mouth debridement. Uh, in this phase, we also extract the teeth that were deemed hopeless, like number three, uh, reevaluate them in, in four weeks. Uh, and then if they still have deep pocketing, uh, scaling and root planing, which is a deep cleaning, and uh, in, in all four of our quadrants. Uh, and then going over oral hygiene instructions. So, you know, you've got to be willing to sit there with a patient and, and help teach, teach them how to brush and floss uh, appropriately. And then she did have several caries. So she would go to her general dentist and get those cavities filled. Uh, phase two, after we do a deep cleaning, we reevaluate the patient four to six weeks later. Uh, and this is also another appointment where you can reinforce oral hygiene. You take a look in their mouth, see how they're doing, point out spots that they're missing. Uh, I always tell my patients that they have to look at me as their coach or their spotter in the gym, right? Yet when you go to the gym and, and you're lifting, uh, there's so many things to keep in mind. Shoulders back, head straight, you know, uh, back straight, chest up, that you need someone there to point out everything. And that's essentially what I am. You know, they're going to come in and, and the mouth is, is difficult to clean, especially in a patient with periodontitis where they've had bone loss and they've got all these extra nooks and crannies to accumulate plaque. And I'm constantly pointing, pointing out places that they're missing and places to improve upon. So the patients that get better at each visit, those patients see great uh, success. And the patients that still neglect their home care, I just don't like to treat at all. You know, they can come when they're ready, but that's part of perio is making that decision on, on when to proceed with surgical therapy and when not to. Uh, then we get to our, our surgical phase um, where we'll extract not the teeth that are hopeless, but 16 and 17 are her third molars. And because they're so far back in her mouth, she's having a, a hard time keeping them clean. So while we don't need to extract them for uh, 
for orthodontic or other reasons, we're extracting them to help her manage the plaque and the type of biofilm that she has in her mouth. And then four quadrants of osteosurgery. This is that resective type of surgery in the, in the uh, perio treatment umbrella. Then we have our post-surgical evaluations where we see them at two weeks and four weeks. And then once they're stabilized, then they move on to the definitive restorative rehabilitation. So any crowns that they need, in this patient's case, it was a partial denture. Uh, and then we keep them on three-month periodontal recall. So I, I took this patient through uh, uh, first debridement and then a deep cleaning. Uh, this was a patient where she brought her husband every time. I talked to both of them. That's a really good trick is to always talk to the spouse when talking about home care because they're they'll usually make sure that their, their spouse is doing it at home. Um, it's just a, a, another pair of ears and eyes uh, at home to, to help them with their home care. So you can see that number three that was just floating in gum tissue, it was moving like a joystick, we removed. And after two rounds of cleaning, you know, even, even though you guys aren't in, in dental school, I hope you can appreciate the uh, turn of events and how she's approaching gingival health. So we actually didn't even need to go into the surgical phase. Her pocketing was well-managed and under control just with non-surgical therapy alone, um, which is something that a uh, that, uh, hygienist does. So non-surgical therapy and, and deep cleanings and, and debriding teeth is the greatest thing that we can do uh, in, in dentistry. I really believe that. Uh, so I, all the offices, I tell them to have their hygienist do all the cleanings first and then then I'll come in for just the, the surgical procedures and that's more worth my time. But it's still nice to appreciate non-surgical therapy and it helps you give a, a foundation of periodontics. Here you can see her maxillary anterior sextant, much cleaner, the gingiva is a lot more pink, less bleeding. Um, we're seeing the same trend throughout uh, and you'll notice that more of the roots are exposed right? Because that inflamed gingiva comes down to the level of where the bone is. And that's the goal. That's what we want is to reduce those pockets, reduce the type of biofilm and plaque that the patient has in their mouth and reduce the amount of anaerobic bacteria that they have in their oral microflora. And this is her, you can see that we redid her mandibular splint because her splint was attracting too much plaque. It was very bulky. Uh, and then the new splint is, is much more hygienic and easier to keep clean. Here we can, we can really appreciate how much more tooth structure and, and roots are exposed. Uh, and this patient maintained her teeth for the past three years. So she came to our, uh, to the Stony Brook Perry department because she went to three other dentists and they just wanted to extract all her teeth. She came to a perio department to save her teeth. And I think that's really the foundation of perio is, is saving teeth. So I, I think it's, you know, sometimes we can over-treat with implants specifically. You, know, you give someone a hammer and everything looks like a nail, but this is traditional periodontics and it, it still does a great service to, to people and patients. And here we can see her reevaluation. I'm not gonna get into the numbers. And when we look at the overview of her, her pocket depths, she only had one pocket in her whole mouth. I was above five millimeters. So she's gone mostly from severe and moderate to moderate and healthy pockets. Um, and she'll stay on you know, cleaning every single three months. Every time plaque and calculus accumulate, she'll have a cleaning every three months to just maintain those teeth as long as possible. So just a recap of this first case, non-surgical therapy is the first line of defense in maintaining periodontal disease. Um, and it also lets the patient know that they have periodontal disease early, right? Getting back to that dental negligence problem. If, uh, you know, the deep cleanings would have been much easier. If the patient came in when she only had a few six millimeter pockets or if it was still early on her disease progression, um, and so it just educates the patient and lets them know that they have a problem or they're genetically susceptible to periodontal disease. 
Uh, Re-evaluations occur four to six weeks after, and then surgical intervention if, if necessary. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, three month recall is, is key to success. I tell my patients, they have to think of it like a haircut every three months, they're coming in for cleaning. And these instruments in the lower right are scalars. And this is what we use to clean the root surfaces of teeth. So this is a, a second case. This is a 73 year old male. He comes in with a chief complaint. I know I need some teeth pulled. He reports no pain or discomfort, and he has severe dental anxiety, and his medical history is significant for Parkinson's. So, you know, I'm not going to get into each section like I did before, because I just want to show you a, the surgical aspect of dentistry, of, of periodontics. So if you look, he was sent over to extract 2425. These are the two mandibular central incisors in the front. Uh, and you can see that the bone loss is vertical, right? In the first case, they were horizontal, it was flat. But between 2425, we have this vertical defect. So he was sent over to have those extracted. But uh, the other aspect of, I talked about resective surgery. And, you know, the other aspect is regenerative surgery where we can try and regenerate the bone that was lost. And we can only do that if we have a vertical defect because success of, of any type of graft, whether it's soft tissue and a gum graft or hard tissue to regenerate bone, the success of any graft depends on immobilizing the graft. So if we have flat horizontal uh, bone loss, you can imagine I, I can't put any type of graft particulate or any way to immobilize that graft. Uh, and also there's no blood supply for that graft. But when we see a vertical defect like this, you automatically think, okay, I have walls to contain my graft and immobilize it. And I also have blood supply from those walls to sustain the graft. And that's essentially what we did. So here I have just my sulcular incision. Um, this is just the basic incision that we do around teeth. And then here we have our full thickness uh, flap or flaps reflective, full thickness, meaning it goes all the way down to bone, taking the periosteum with it. And you can see my defect is about six millimeters deep. But remember those walls, the picture on the right really shows the, those, those walls to contain the graft. If you put this, this graft particular in there, you can immobilize it. And that's essentially what we did. So on the left, you can see this cortical cancellus allograft. Um, it just, it's uh, osseo, uh, conductive and osseoinductive. It just forms a scaffold in there and your own bone replaces it over time. And that was packed and mixed with enamel matrix derivative, which are porcine derived tooth buds, like uh, stem cells in a way for regenerating cementum and regenerating the periodontal apparatus. And on the right, we have a membrane to secure it. So I could have you know, at the time, if I had it, I could have used a PRF membrane instead. Um, the PRF membrane in the normal centrifuge without heating it up would only last a couple of weeks, though, uh, where this lasts six. But now with our current technology, we can have a membrane that lasts months and it's your own body. So that's most likely what I'll be trying to use from now on. And then just suture with just single interrupted sutures. And here we have our two weeks post-operative. So I, I removed the stitches and, and took this photograph, but they're usually quick appointments. And here's three months later, what it looks like. Uh, and you can't really appreciate what was done until you take a radiograph. So you can see the pre-op radiograph all the way on the left. This is what the patient looked like when he first came to me. The middle radiograph was taken immediately after the procedure. So you can see I packed that bone graft. I probably could have packed it a little bit more. You can see a little void against that tooth. And then I, like I said, your own body and your own bone replaces that scaffold. And that's what we see three months postoperatively. So he came in for two extractions on, on mobile teeth and we were able to regenerate the interproximal bone that was lost. Uh, and, and have those teeth tighten up. So it saved them from needing a partial denture and needing to figure out how to replace those teeth later on, which was a really good service. Um, and also this, the patient uh, 
like I said, he has Parkinson's. So he had really uh, a lot of trouble with a manual toothbrush. So we switched him to electric and it just made the biggest difference from him. For him, you can see on the left, this was what he looked like on a manual toothbrush. And you can look specifically on those lower front teeth right around the gums. You can see all that plaque build up uh, compared to the right when he just switched to an electric and he's uh, able to maintain his home care a lot better. So that was the, the key to success in this case, right? You can do the, the best surgery in the world, but if a patient doesn't brush or doesn't take care of it, then it's not gonna work. Uh, and this is a third case. I just wanted to show you, um, you know, replacing teeth or, you know, a, a different aspect of, of, of periodontics as a specialty. So this is a 52 year old female. She says, I have a missing tooth that I want to replace with an implant. Uh, no pain or discomfort. She just wants an extra molar to chew on. Uh, and again, you know, because it's a very straightforward treatment plan, I just want to isolated to this mandibular right sextant. So the tooth that we're working on is, is number 30, which you can see she has missing. And if you look at the ridge, when you, don't, when you have a, a tooth extracted and you don't have a bone graft placed at the time of, or it's been extracted for a long time, we see that that ridge resorbs over time. So while she wanted an implant, she didn't want anything removable or, or she didn't want a three unit bridge, she didn't have enough bone for an implant. And we know this by taking a cone beam scan. So the x-rays that you've been seeing previously are two dimensional. Here we take a, a 3D radiograph that shows us the exact dimensions. Um, and we can see, I mean, you can see at the photo of the right how thin her ridge is. Um, but you can also appreciate that there's a concavity uh, on the ridge. And so that concavity means that I've got something to contain my bone graft material. So that's essentially what we did for this patient. So very similar concept. I uh, did a, a, a full thickness flap reflected. You can see in the lower right, these little holes that I made in her alveolar ridge, those are called corticotomies. And we do that because we wanna reach her uh, um, cancellous bone and medullary bone and produce bleeding. So more bleeding to have growth factors reach our bone graft. Here we packed bone graft. It's the same allograft particulate that I used before. This is the same type of membrane. And on the right, this is a, a suture called a horizontal mattress, which we use to secure the membrane in place so that everything is tight and immobilized. And then you can see on the left, the final suturing, and on the right, the pre-op. So you can see how much more width we gained in her ridge. Her alveolar ridge looks pregnant now compared to before. Uh, for a procedure like this, we wait about six months. So this is what it looked like at three weeks. We can see the shape is maintained. It's a nice thick ridge now. And here's the six month cone beam scan. So you can see the bone that we augmented uh, and she's got much wider dimensions that are more suitable for an implant. And here is the implant placement. So we reflected, uh, full thickness flap was reflected again. You can appreciate how much thicker the ridge was. We were able to get a, a wide implant in there, which will be a nice uh, molar later on. Um, and here's my post-op radiograph. Uh, it's, you know, if I could do this again, if I could do this now, I'd probably place the implant a little bit closer to the premolar and I, I'd place it so that it's equicrustal, it's, it's flush with the alveolar bone. Um, but I, you know, that's, that's should have, would have, could have, but it's just important to look at it and critique yourself. You know, you'll, you'll see in dentistry, you know, when, when you get into dental school and you do crown preps or, you know, you start doing fillings, you could always critique it, right? You can, you're going to have your attendings critique it. You're going to have so many people look at it and say they would do things a little bit differently. And I don't think you should let that discourage you. You just need to embrace it. You know, I, I never get done with a surgery and say, oh, that, that came out perfectly. I crushed it. You know, that was flawless 10 out of 10, you know, because then you'll, you'll never improve. Uh, you got to look at your work and always think, what could I have done to make this a little bit better? 
So this will work out great for her. She'll get a nice restoration. But when I look at it, I'm, I'm not as satisfied. I, I can see things that I would do differently. So, you know, it's important to just critique yourself because a lot of dentists, you know, don't really do that. Uh, and, and here we have four weeks after it's healed up real nicely. Um, after we place an implant, we wait about three months before we expose it. And I actually graduated before exposing it. But, you know, I just wanted to show you a, a different type of case. Um, so that, that was it for my cases. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? I know this was a, a lot of information. I'm not sure how much you guys understood, but that's part of shadowing is you just kind of observe what, what someone does and you're not gonna get 100% of it but you just need that exposure. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Estrin, for the great presentation. I really enjoyed seeing the detailed case studies. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Um, if anyone, oh, this was my, my quote. Um, when we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too. So like I said, if you keep critiquing yourself and keep trying to improve, you know, your patients will benefit, you'll make life easier on your dental assistants and your general dentist. That's just taking it to specific, but I really do believe that when you work on yourself, you know, your, your environment and the people around you benefit as well. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's great. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first question would be, how many shadowing hours do you recommend for pre-dental students? As, as many as you can, as, as many hours as you can, because it's just, you, if, if you're going to learn one thing a day, then it's worth it. Um, but don't, you know, sacrifice your lifestyle for it. Or if you're, if you're visiting an office and you're really not learning that much, try shadowing a different office. You know, try to find a dentist that's really going to take you in and, and put an effort in teaching you. So, you know, I'm, like I said, shadowing is continuous. I'm still shadowing. That's great. Um, next question with, this one's about like the case that you presented with the bio PRF and platelet rich fibrin te technique or tech, I was wondering how or what exactly the platelets strengthen. Does it assist with soft gums and or tissue loss? How big of an area can it treat? That's a, that's a good question. It's not that it strengthens anything. But these platelets, think about when you cut your arm, right? You have a scab that forms, a, a blood clot that forms, and that clot releases growth factors, basal endothelial growth factor, and specifically promotes more blood flow and blood supply, which is something that we need in, in healing and in all our surgeries. So it's those growth factors that are most beneficial. So let's say I take that platelet-rich fibrin and I mix it with bone graft and I put it in a, in a bony defect, right? Then I'm going to induce... Uh, I'm going to induce more bone formation. Or if I put it where I'm placing my gum graft, I'm going to induce more tissue formation. So I think it's just these growth factors are the most important and you have to keep in mind where you're placing them. There are times where you want bone regeneration and times where you want soft tissue regeneration. Um, but that's a, a really great field. It's, it's really expanding. My mentor, uh, Dr. Myron, that I mentioned earlier, now he's taking platelet rich platelet rich fibrin, uh, putting it in, in bio heat, heating it up and actually injecting it in, in people's faces as a kerastatic, so aesthetic option to reduce wrinkles. And, and uh, he's, he's teaming up with dermatologists and, and physicians of all types, orthopedic surgeons to just bring this new technology to all these different fields. Um, and it originated in, in periodontics. So I think that's, that's, awesome for our specialty to just be so involved in, in research and the newest technology. Very interesting. Um, the next question is, why does the conversion of the biofilm from aerobic to anaerobic bacteria cause problems? Does it have something to do with acidic byproducts that they produce? Definitely the acidic byproducts, some of them, the, uh, the gram negative bacteria specifically, but it's more uh, when you'll, you'll learn about it in dental school, but you'll see these red complex bacteria like P. gingivalis is the most major periodontal pathogen. And what it does is it can replicate and actually 
infiltrate the connective tissue, right? So it's not just on the tooth now, all of a sudden it's replicating into the connective tissue. Um, and that's why it generates this, this exaggerated inflammatory response. Uh, but it's, it's evident of a mature biofilm. So first that forms are these green and yellow complex bacteria. And then you've got these bridging species of bacteria before it reaches the red complex. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. That's why I tell patients, you know, there's no medicine that I can give you for periodontal disease because it's not as, it's not a systemic issue that we can treat. The etiology is the plaque and biofilm that you have around your teeth. So your medicine is this toothbrush and this floss and mechanical debridement to remove this plaque. What do you know about orange bacteria on the teeth? Orange bacteria. So that's like Fusobacterium nucleatum. That's the bridging species. So yellow, orange bacteria, right? And orange is the bridging species that paves way for the red complex to attach to the biofilm. Interesting. How successful are gum grafts? It, de it depends what the goal is. There are different types of gum grafts, like a connective tissue graft is more suitable for covering recession, but a free gingival graft is more suitable for increasing the amount of attached tissue. So they're very successful if they're done by an experienced clinician and the right uh, treatment option is suited for the right treatment objective, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, in the case, in the third case, number 31 was medially tilted. I wanted to know whether it imposes any negative effect on oral hygiene maintenance. Absolutely, because when it's measly tilted, right, you've got this mesial inclination that you can accumulate plaque. Uh, in those cases, we like to send them to an orthodontist to upright that molar and then we and, and close that space so it's more appropriate for an implant. Uh, but there's ideal and there's reality, right? Ideally, that's what we'd like to do. But the reality is a lot of patients don't want to go see an orthodontist to upright a molar for the periodontist to place an implant for the general dentist to put a crown on it. So, you know, she essentially elected not to go through orthodontic therapy. But if she did, it would have made the case, it would have been a, a better outcome in that case for sure. What was your favorite part of LECOM Dental School? LECOM Dental School, my favorite part. Uh, the fact that it was in Florida, that was the first time that I lived in Florida, you know, going to, going to Siesta Key Beach and, and going to all these uh, fun places. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're there with all your peers. Everyone's going to be a dentist of some type. Uh, and, and some of the closest friends I made were at LECOM. So there's that, that was my favorite part. But what's great about LECOM as a dental school is that there are no residency programs there. So when I went to Stony Brook for Perio, uh, all the dental students would send a lot of their endo and, and Perio to the endo and Perio residencies. But at LECOM, there's no residency to defer to. So you essentially do pretty much everything that you can for the patient. Um, and I think that's a, a strength of LECOM is you're actually gonna do a lot more. I wanted to ask one last question before we end the session. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned that you're a, yeah, you travel to different offices, including private practice and corporate offices. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind talking a little bit about your experience between the different types of practices? Yeah, so my experience is so different at each office. Some offices I love and my life is easy at those offices and some offices I, I don't love so much. Um, you know, it's, you, you can imagine a different culture at each type of office, a different workflow at each type of office. Um, and that's essentially what you can try and do as a specialist is pick up a lot of different jobs and, and keep the ones you like and drop the ones that you don't like. Uh, but I do really like the flexibility. Like I, you know, have been taking off a lot for weddings and bachelor parties and, and things that I've been needing to attend to. And it's been very easy to take, take time off. Um, I won't get paid for those days, but 
Um, it's just simple as sending a text message. Hey, I can't be here on this date, this date, and this date. So awesome. There's well, there's pros and cons to each side. You know, you're gonna mm-hmm. you're gonna figure out what works for you. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Estrin, for answering yeah. all of our questions. No, my my pleasure. And like I said, I wasn't a star applicant in any way. Um, you know, and I, I don't want anyone to hesitate on reaching out to me. You know, I can share those those documents on interview preparation or, or help however I can. So if anyone does have questions, just, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Yep. Um, make sure you guys follow Dr. Estrin on his social media. This is his Instagram here. And thank you guys again for all of your questions and for joining our session tonight. And we hope you all have a great rest of your night. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys.